intellectual, political, and material resources. Today, we are extremely grateful to host a panel of youth leaders and an older adult advocate who works with them to learn from the expertise and knowledge grounded in their lived experience to discuss how we may collaborate meaningfully and equitably to seek effective and sustainable solutions to homelessness. This event is co-hosted by the Institute for Innovation and Implementation and the Homeless Persons Representation Project. Our wonderfully challenging and creative partnership mirrors our aspirations for an inclusive and challenging policy process that is as true to Daniel Thurz's social justice legacy as our featured panel will be. I am honored and pleased to now introduce Michelle Zabel, Assistant Dean and Director of the Institute for Innovation and Implementation. Dean Zabel's vision for the Institute as a space that uplifts all voices to nurture par partnerships for meaningful change has infused all of our discussions about this panel, which began well over a year ago. I want to warmly welcome Dean Zabel to join us now. Thank you, Corey. And welcome everyone. I am Michelle Zabel and I am an assistant dean at the school and I am the proud director of the Institute for Innovation and Implementation. You know, our work at the Institute is to build research-based, inclusive, culturally responsive and transformative child, youth and family serving systems, as well as to develop the workforce within these systems. Everything we do is grounded in a commitment to social justice and partnership with youth and families. An important part of our work at the Institute is focused on addressing and preventing housing instability and homelessness among youth and young adults. And I am just thrilled that we've partnered with the school and the Homeless Persons Representation Project on this, the 2021 Daniel Thurs Social Justice Lecture. I want to give a warm welcome to the Thurs family and a genuine heartfelt thank you to the thoughtful and brilliant group of panelists who are assembled for tonight's discussion. They truly are the experts on their own experience, as well as on the ways that we can collaborate with youth to prevent and end homelessness. As you can imagine, the Institute's work has always been most impactful and sustainable whenever we've partnered closely with youth, young adults and their families. They are critical leaders in every step towards creating meaningful change. Some of tonight's panelists also work alongside us as Youth Reach Maryland Steering Committee members and ambassadors, supporting Maryland's biannual youth count to better understand which youth are experiencing homelessness and housing instability, the services and the supports that have worked, those that haven't, and what it would look like to intervene earlier to make youth homelessness rare and brief. Youth Reach Maryland, funded by the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, is now in its fourth year of data collection, and we are so appreciative of the local and state partners including the Maryland General Assembly that have continued to support this work. The Institute is fortunate to lead two other initiatives in Maryland that are guided by youth voice and strive to end and prevent homelessness. In Baltimore City, Be More Succeeds is a partnership with the Yes Drop-In Center, service providers and Baltimore City government to provide integrated services and supports to youth and young adults with substance use disorders who are experiencing homelessness or housing instability, and may be parent or parenting or pregnant. On Maryland's Midshore, we continue to implement the Enhanced Youth Transition Planning Model, which trains and coaches the foster care workforce to partner with older youth experiencing foster care to develop a youth-driven plan to support a successful transition to adulthood. I invite you to learn more about these and other initiatives by joining us on May 26th and 27th at our upcoming virtual conference, Sparking Positive Change, a Symposium to End Youth Homelessness. This year's symposium will focus on intentional shifts that must occur to address the disproportionate number of Black and Brown and LGBTQ plus youth experiencing housing instability and homelessness in Maryland. The link is in the chat and we hope to see you there. 
So without any further ado, I want to welcome the moderator of tonight's panel, Desiree Jefferson. Desiree is a youth activist and the unaccompanied youth program coordinator for His Hope Ministries, working with youth on Maryland's Midshore. Desiree, I want to thank you for your leadership and take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Desiree Jefferson, and I'm the unaccompanied youth coordinator here at His Hope Ministries in Denton, Maryland, and I will be moderating this panel today. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight. We will be discussing about how youth are advocating for systemic change relating to youth homelessness and how important it is for youth with lived experience to be leaders in this work. This is not a homelessness 101. However, I can share some information that you may not know. Homelessness does not have a phase. You may not know that youth in your community are experiencing homelessness because we look like everyone else. Just a couple years ago, I was experiencing homelessness and I look just the same. Some people think that we're just, you know, like rule breakers and we don't um, we're too lazy to get assistance, but there actually are some agencies that get youth funding but don't have youth-based services. Also, there are some youth that avoid services because they're focused on survival. And there are other youth that don't wanna admit their, their homelessness because of their peers and bullying. And some youth may not even think that they're homeless because they're couch surfing. We have questions prepared for you tonight, but we would like to we would like this to be a conversation. So please put any of your questions in the chat and later on, we will pick some of those questions to respond to. Isabel McLean, who is a student at the University of Maryland School of Social Work and has worked for Homeless Persons Representative Project for her internship this year, will be moderating the Q&A section of this session at the end. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists for tonight. We have Klaus Farrell, Lola Jay, Christopher Sakalis and Ingrid Lofgren. I would let them tell you more about themselves. Passing it off to you, Klaus. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Klaus. I am an alumni of the Youth Empowered Society, a staff member at Art with the Heart, a, non, uh, a nonprofit visual arts organization. And also I am an active member of the Baltimore City Youth Action Board. Um, I'd have to say my journey first began as far as like navigating systems and navigating the the spectrum of homelessness and things like and things of that nature began when I was 14. Um, from that age, all the way up to I was 24. So that was roughly a decade if I want to estimate that I was experiencing homelessness and going through housing instability and things of that nature of those issues. And um, all the way getting through to the point of where I am now has not been easy. It's been a struggle. It's been filled with this trials and tribulations and its own sets of obstacles and things like that. And I know that one thing that kept me going through everything is vigilance. And I've always had, I've always had a dream or an idea that I knew that there was better than what I was experiencing. I knew that there was more out there for me than what I was experiencing. I'm originally not from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm actually from North Carolina, a small town called Nashville, actually. And that's where my humble beginnings began, essentially. And um, throughout my journey, throughout my life, I found my way to many of different places. I've experienced many different things. I've had many different issues. Um, and everything that I've experienced, everything that I've gone through has led me to this point to where I am today. Um, today, I am, a, I am a loving father. I have a five-year-old daughter. That means absolutely the world to me. And she has been a very big driving point for my motivation and for my determination to get to where I am now, to be at the level of living that I'm at now. I've, uh, I've gone through a great amount of time throughout my life surviving. And oftentimes I found that confusing with living. When I think about the larger concept of everything, I was never living at all. I was literally just surviving day to day, worrying about what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to sleep, wondering what's going to happen to me tomorrow, things of that nature. All that stuff was always at the forefront of my mind rather than the better, the well, the more, uh, 
developed things that I could have been worrying about. But nonetheless, I have made it to where I am today and I'm more than happy to be here. Um, as far as these opportunities to be able to advocate and to be able to speak in, you know, in these spaces, I'm more than grateful to be a part of these, these conversations. I'm more than grateful to be a part of these discussions. Um, growing up, I never felt like I had the voice to make a difference. And two years ago, I learned that everything that I have said, everything that I have done has carried weight and has carried power to it. If it didn't just speak for my tenacity, I also spoke for the determination of the other youth that are out here experiencing the same things that I do or that I have, hence why we have these panels, why we have these webinars, why we have these conversations. And so being able to be in these spaces is, is just, it is an ode to the work that I've done to get here, but the work that I'm also, like, I'm also dedicated to continue doing to make sure that myself and others like myself don't have to repeat ourselves and have to have more conversations in the future with, uh, with other youth that are going through the exact same things that we do. And so now with that, I want to pass it on to Chris. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris. I am a homeless youth ambassador. And I'm currently a homeless youth myself, trying to get back on my feet through his hope ministry with the help of Desiree and others working alongside her. Um, yeah, I am 18 years old. I am in a sexual relationship with my loving boyfriend and yeah I'd like to pass the mic over to Ingrid. Thanks Chris. Um, my name is Ingrid Lofgren. I use she her pronouns. I'm director of the Youth Initiative at Homeless Persons Representation Project which is a legal services nonprofit. Um, so I am the older adult ally that was referenced earlier. Um, I'm just really grateful um, to be in this space um, with my partners um, talking with you this evening. Um, I have been at HPRP doing this work since 2012. Um, I provide direct legal support um, to youth and young adults and also do a lot of systemic advocacy, um, which um, increasingly I am trying to do more and more in real authentic collaboration with youth. And that is um, a journey uh, that I'm on and very much in a place of learning. Um, I am from Calvert County, Maryland, um, in Southern Maryland. I left home there when I was 17 because of conflict in my family. And um, even though I didn't have to deal with so many of the systemic issues that a lot of youth have, especially the youth and young adults that I've worked with in Baltimore City. It's still just the emotional impact of the issues with my family and having to figure out, um, you know, what my next steps were going to be when I was really hurting was really destabilizing. So even with so many privileges. Um, you know, that for me led to a lot of, you know, self-destructive, unhealthy behaviors that, um, you know, in turn sort of had a snowball effect on just how I felt about myself and my life. So I'm really, really proud of being able to be part of this work now. Um, and yeah, just really, um, a lot of what Klaus was saying about how incredible and tenacious and resilient youth and young adults are that are having to navigate these situations, I just echo 1 million percent. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Lola. Hi, everyone. I'm Lola J. I am the current chair of Baltimore's Youth Action Board. Um, I sit on the board of directors for, yes, Youth Empowered Society um, and a bunch of other seats. But um, I'm a full-time activist for this because I've lived it. I experienced homelessness after my freshman year of college. So it was never in my plans to become homeless. I mean, I don't think it's in anyone's plans, but 
I had dreams, aspirations, and goals that I had planned on achieving, and I got sideswiped. Uh, my mom couldn't pick me up from college four hours away, and she was like, figure it out. Um, I came to Baltimore. I, I went to Savannah State University, so I came to Baltimore, and I had planned on only staying for three months. And that has now been six years, eight years. Um, I've been in every type of housing in Baltimore City. So I've been in an emergency shelter. I've been in transitional housing, permanent housing. Um, so I have a very unique experience and insight detail. And I received a voucher through a program. So I've currently been housed for about six years and I just do my part and my portion to make sure I give back because I feel as though your experiences aren't yours alone. You go through what you go through so you can help someone who comes after you have a better experience. And my earpod just fell out. <laughs> and um that's why I do what I do. So my tenacity and my headstrongness and everything that makes me me has come in handy for breaking down bears and, you know, breaking systematical change. Chains, excuse me. Desiree? Thanks, everyone. So we're going to get to the questions now. So what has it been like for you to navigate systems as a youth experiencing homelessness and what barriers have you faced along the way? So necessarily, as I mentioned earlier, um, navigating the system hasn't always been the easiest thing for me. Um, I've, been, I've met a good amount of challenges along that way personally. Um, I want to say it first began as a youth. I was what probably 16 or 17. Um, I was going through homelessness and I was attempting to uh, I, I was trying to get myself through high school. And I want to say this is the very beginning of my association with like the system and services and things of that nature. So I was about 16, 17, and I was I was in high school and I was I was an independent. And yet it was hard for me to try to explain my situation. You know what I mean? It's hard to to just to come out right, you know, as a youth to say to, to adults, principals and police officers, things of that nature, guidance counselors, whatever may have you, to say, yeah, I'm a home, I'm a homeless youth. My father kicked me out and I don't have anywhere to go. And so it, it wasn't, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't easy for me to be able to like, just to, just to let those things be known. So um, I, I was introduced, I, I, I befriended my guidance counselor at one of my high schools that I went to. I ended up getting kicked out of multiple high schools. Um, I've had behavioral issues. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had behavioral issues. And so, um, you know, it, it like having, I, I often talk to, to guidance counselors to try to find some, to try to find some place to, to, to stabilize myself mentally because I didn't have that foundation. I didn't have that stability within myself um, and nor was it given to me either. And so my first introduction was going into getting myself registered as an independent into in the school system. And then going from that point, I ended up having to learn how to try to, I learned this myself, having to navigate, how to navigate through social services and to get food stamps. That wasn't easy because I didn't have my information that I needed, such as a birth certificate or my social security number. I didn't know what my social security number was. Um, and I didn't know that that was a requirement. And so when they, you know, when they pull up all this, all this foreign information to me, I'm just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, how do I get this? How do I get that? And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm working in, and I'm, I'm like, I'm living in a place where I'm trying to navigate a space where they expect you to know how to do everything. They expect you to have the know-how, or they expect you to have the information to, to, to just get the ball rolling and just keep the process rolling. And so with me not having that information, it was very discouraging me for, for me to want to, to access these systems, to access these services, because with this, with this, this air of expectancy of me to know what to do and me not knowing what to do, there was that air of like, I wouldn't want to say it's embarrassment or anything like that, but 
it, it's something along those lines. I, I just don't, I, would, I don't know how to put my finger on that word exactly. But with that, um, I, I, neg I neglected myself and I neglected the, uh, the, my ability to navigate inside of these systems or at least gather the information to learn how to navigate inside of these systems. And so I just went through the hard way, you know, and the hard way isn't definitely that the hard way. Um, uh, so um, when I was around what, I wanna say I was 22, I actually learned I got the information that I needed to actually navigate social services. I got food stamps and things of that nature. As I got older, about to say 23, I, I got vouchers and things of that nature too, um, in order to help me, you know, like further put myself forward, you know what I mean? And it was a lot, there was a, it was a bit of an easier role for me because I was homeless for seven years plus, you feel me? And there is no reason why I should have been homeless for seven years. I was 14 years old starting so there is no reason why i should have been homeless for seven plus years and why that is the the one thing that that uh that solidified my uh my my my, my placement in the system you feel me like there's no reason why you know it's, it's i had to experience homelessness for seven plus years in order for me to have this opportunity but thankfully through my hardships i got that opportunity you feel me so therefore i have i have a place to house my daughter i have an apartment i have somewhere to lay my head i don't have to sleep in a parking lot i don't have to keep my clothes in a trash bag anymore and hiding them off in some bushes or anything like that i don't have to live the life i did before but <clears throat> navigating these systems really wasn't the easiest uh it wasn't the easiest road but i did you know i explained that just a tip Does anybody else have any thoughts? Klaus, it's so crazy that you say that because I think that that's every youth who's unaccompanied. I think that's the proper way to say this. Every homeless youth is experience of navigating social services and it's, they give you all these things that you don't need. And a lot of times people hate their jobs they aren't friendly. They don't understand how you're here to receive a service and you don't know exactly how to navigate the system. And honestly, I just feel like getting assistance should be like going to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> People should be saying, my pleasure. People should want to help you. It should be a pleasant experience. And people should want to be there. Um, I think one of the barriers I really experienced was like you, Klaus, I wasn't born here in Baltimore. I was actually born in New York. And I remember in order to get certain documents, I had to, um, go to certain programs and like get my birth certificate. And I spent the whole day waiting and line, et cetera, et cetera, for them to tell me that, oh, we only help. Baltimore residents and finding out that I had to go all the way to New York and do the same thing in courthouse buildings in Manhattan and I knew nothing about anything so like those things people don't understand um how to help like people don't understand how scary it is to do those things anyone else Okay. If no one else has any remarks about the first question, we'll move on. What is your? I'd like to say something. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Like, I like what Klaus and Lily were saying about um, unaccompanied youth and like avoiding or neglecting themselves. It's like very similar to that. When I was about four years ago, whenever my life struggles started before I became completely homeless. My mom stopped showing up to the house for for lunch at a time. Like say one week, one time, she'll be back at three a.m. Leave two hours later and be gone for two more weeks. And I had to be there with my siblings and watch them, and she wouldn't be there to take care of us. So when we went to school, and the counselors were trying to like talk to us, say they could provide things. I felt like the things I'd be telling them were incriminating. I was afraid of getting my family in trouble. So I avoided trying to get that help. 
like how there is no food in the house. At the end of the week, every Friday, they had food bags sitting there. But I was too embarrassed because I don't want my friends to see that I didn't have food at the house. I didn't want to look weak. I didn't want to look like a loser. I didn't want to lose friends because I didn't have the necessities that everyone else had. I didn't have a phone. Though. I didn't have a phone at all until I was 14. And even then, I got the bill paid once. And after that, I couldn't use it for like three years after that. And later on throughout the, like, without my parents being there and everything, I wasn't able to make it to school. So eventually I was missing a hundred days a year school. I was failing. I didn't get to pass the 10th grade because of the, I felt like a loser because all of my friends were going up to 11th grade and I was still sitting here like, I'm not getting my stuff done. I'm a clown in class. I try to make jokes because I like making people laugh. But at the end of the day, it didn't really get me anywhere. And I would go to their counselor's office. They'll talk to me. And my sisters will say something now and then, like they're being neglected. They aren't getting food at home. Mom's not there to watch her. And they would come to me too. And I know I should be telling them these things, but I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. I didn't want the family to be divided any more than it already was due to my siblings that were older have leaving. And I didn't want my little sisters to live without a mom because she was off doing her own thing. And um, <clears throat> like it was possible. So I would avoid those systems. I haven't been to a doctor for like a couple of years because I haven't had a ride nor the money for a taxi or anything. I wasn't capable of those things or anything, stuff like that. Um, and then whenever I finally was like working towards getting that stuff, it was hard because I was trying to get food stamps. I was handed a packet, packed like this thick with stuff that has nothing to pertain to me. So I couldn't answer any questions. I like five papers thrown out. And um, uh, after that, uh, I didn't feel like I filled it out properly. So I didn't end up turning it in altogether. I was like, this isn't going to get me anywhere until eventually I did it online. And uh, now I have food stamps. I got government things like laws and everything. That are in, I'm in there and all that fun stuff. But yeah, um, that's it for me. Um, if you don't Thanks, Chris. Okay, so what is your vision of a youth-centered system that is designed to meet the needs of a youth experiencing homelessness? I believe. Okay, I had to um mute my mic. I'm sorry. Oh, Chris, go ahead. Take it. Okay, yeah, I believe uh, the center system should mostly be run by youth. Of course, yes, adults should be involved with the concept of other youths um, working with one another, being able to understand each other and everything would definitely benefit everyone. Um, it would definitely help things move faster, probably more smooth, like than being able to understand each other and like be able to get that bond and everything. Uh, like I said, also having adults involved in everything, because yes, sometimes the youths will need that guidance of like um, a person with more perspective, you know, don't want to be closed minded, want to be open about it with no boxes or anything. And that's how I feel about the situation. Anyone else would like to? I think there should be more programs and um, platforms where youth can be in charge because I like being in charge. And I like, I mean, who doesn't like when people listen to them? 
and not try to pacify them, et cetera, et cetera. I believe when youth have their own programs and own services specified for them, then it will be better at accomp accompanying them. Y'all know the word I'm trying to say. So for example, at Sinai, they have a children's ER that's designated just for children. So social services, housing, all these programs and assistant programs should have something that is designated just for youth that are trauma-informed, informed on adultism, um, things that they know how to interact with youth. Um, I don't like the hard cutoff of like an age for young adult. Um, what is like, you don't want to age out. Like it's just a transition period of having um, more responsibility, but actually youth who are homeless and experience homelessness have had these responsibilities for a while. And like Klaus was saying, being in survival mode is a difference from living. Um, I was talking about this today in one of my meetings. Um, you should be involved in the beginning of processes. You shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be that youth are going to be looped in after at least, not even at least, I don't want to say at least, at the max. <laughs> Offer it, hand it out, say, hey, you're more than welcome to come and give your input and your expertise. And yeah. <laughs> I agree like a big part with what you said Lola um I wanted I just want to echo with what you said a little bit like having youth at the uh at the table at the beginning of planning and organization is super important to any to any like youth to any youth centered service or anything like that um and, in my opinion um I have this big thing of where uh necessarily I don't feel as if we have enough services or we have enough organizations with the idea of writing towards servicing youth with youth. Um, I know that that's a, that's a conversation that's being had now at the table more often than more often than not nowadays, now that this, uh, this spearhead is being driven into the topic so, so often, but the, uh, the idea of youth being a part of the planning, youth being, <clears throat> in the center of the workspace to get these ideas or to get these uh, these uh, these concepts just on the planning board and rolling out forward is, is is a key to having the youth perspective on what a youth needs. Um, I know we had this conversation not too long ago, Lola, where you said that um, involving youth at the very beginning is, is a good idea but when you're involving them in a process that they have no idea what they're doing it's going to completely it's going to turn them off and it's going to turn them away because they don't know what you're asking of them and they don't know what they're being involved in because this is such a this is it, it comes at a point of where it's no longer an entry point sort of uh sort of concept or sort of idea that we're doing this is more of an advanced or sort of uh uh, a veteran I've been doing this for about five years so I know this will work and we've been doing this for so long and I already know how this works versus somebody who's fresh out the box they just you know they just walked in and it's like what do I do I, I don't know what I'm doing I wasn't taught this stuff but I want to be a part of what you're doing you feel me there there is a right way and a wrong way to introduce somebody in, into something and throwing them to the wolves is not always the right way don't get me wrong a lot of us have had to learn with that that sink or swim mentality like we have to learn how to swim or we're going to sink and the only reason why we got to where we are is because we swam far enough you feel me and so in, in that in an exact same sort of uh space in that same exact sort of capacity you got to have youth ready to you got to prepare them. You got to you got to organize them. You got to you got to inform them of what they're getting themselves into. So then when they walk down on that floor, they've got a better idea of what they're doing next versus not having any idea of what's going on and which way is left, which way is right, which way is up or which way is down. So to piggyback off of that, I can give an example. Um, on my program, we had to choose youth 
on the process of picking an ED firm, like a search firm to look for an ED. And I'm like, y'all, this is too much information. Like I work in childcare. A lot of people who have been in meetings with me know I multitask like crazy. But if you think of children, it's like asking your children, okay, where in the United States do you want to move? Pick a state. Okay, now pick a city instead of like, okay, out of these 10 houses, pick a house. I do feel as though it's important to have youth included, but also remaining a balance of not overwhelming and giving a sensory overload and making youth feel I like I don't think people understand how frustrating it can be when you don't understand what's really going on or you don't understand the detriment and like how important something is and it can be kind of intimidating when you're given that much responsibility and it's like I don't want to screw up So I feel like all the legwork and the hard work can be done. Youth can be present. It's it's finding a balance because you don't want to say, oh, do all the work and then present them with two options. And then at the same time, you don't want to have them overwhelmed. So that's why I say give the option, give the choice, give the voice to share that and have them present and not make them feel burdened. And I kind of feel like I'm contradicting myself because I was arguing this morning about like, no, I should have been in this meeting from the jump, but I know I can handle certain conversations and certain decisions. Whereas certain people are like, what if I make the wrong decision? What if this? And I'm like, you know, even if I can't make it to this meeting, you always extend it. It's like when you're hanging out with your friends and they having a party and you know you wasn't going to go. And they know you wasn't going to go. But invite me anyway so I can tell you I don't want to go. Just in case I did want to go this one time. You just, you don't know. So how do you think that youth leaders working, like how, how can youth leaders work on making this vision a reality? And what needs to change to shift the power back to the youth? I think it, it's not it's not about shifting the power back to the youth, in my opinion. It's about sharing the power with the youth, um, because too much of one thing can be a bad thing. And, and I, we've heard that one plenty of times. You know what I'm saying? Like people always say, I want all the candy in the world, but too much of that candy is going to be a bad thing. And if you want too much of one thing, how about too much homework after that? You know what I'm saying? That's all we were always posed with that argument as a kid. It's like, if you want too much of one thing, how about too much homework? You can you handle that kind of thing, you know? So we, you always want to keep that healthy balance of including the parties in, 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 a, in an equal fashion. As I, as I mentioned with the last question, a lot of it has to come with coexistence. A lot of come, a lot of it has to come with collaboration, cooperation. You have to be able to 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 to, to bring a certain level-headedness to the table in order to to work with an individual or work with a a class group from from a different from a different age, even. You know what I'm saying? Because like when we look at this from this concept, where we're bringing in older adults with with youth. You feel me? And that's 14 to 24 with anybody from 30 and up. And so when you think about putting these two individuals, like these two groups of individuals in a room together, they're both raised in two different ways, both coming from two different backgrounds. Well, we're all coming from different backgrounds, obviously, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. We all come back, you know, come from different different generational issues and things of that nature. So with all of that, there's obviously problems evolve. And if problems don't exist anymore, then they will replace with something else because obviously we're not going to get, we're not going to eradicate any problem ever. That's not, that's not a concept that we can actually, you know, look at and, and actually be able to like fathom right now. But you know what I mean? If, if it's not, if it's not one thing that can, that can be solved with an older method, then it's something that's old that can be solved with a newer method. We need to be able to bridge the gap between the, the, between the, uh, the idea of, I know better than you because I'm older than you and you can't tell me because you don't know how I feel because you didn't know what I went through, you know, kind of thing. Like when you look at it, everybody, like there's these, these, these stereotypical mindsets that come with your, that come with the, the age group. And those are the things that set us apart the most. I feel as if, if we were able to, to, to take away the, um, 
the, the elitist attitudes, the adultism. We were to take away these, these perspectives in a discussion or take these out of us out of a space and just sit in a space and sit inside that space and have a conversation, we'd get a lot further than than butting heads or than clashing ideals. Um, like I said before, things have evolved over time. And if they haven't evolved, then they obviously have been replaced. And that's that's a very big, that's a very big ode to the idea of collaboration. Even in today's, I even in even in today's realistic situations, if we're if we're looking past like youth homelessness and we're looking at the broader general aspect of things that are happening in reality today, as far as like COVID nineteen and things like that, the as far as we've gotten, we've only gotten so far as we have because of collaboration. We've only gotten gotten as far as we have because of partnerships and sharing information. And that that by itself is an idea to look at it as we should work more for we should work more together. And looking at these spaces where youth are being merged into conversations, it should definitely be a thing of where they're involved in the conversation from the very beginning. Collaborating and sharing information and sharing the power is always going to get us further to where we need to get or to where we want to be. And the only thing that's keeping us from getting there is us ourselves. And in the idealistic fashion, we wouldn't be here. We would have been left this, uh, this stage in our development a long time ago. But we all can't share the same mindset because we're not all in the same space with the mind. So once we all get there, then we'll all get a lot further and get to a better place. It's my turn. Klaus, you're so brilliant. Only ones keeping us back is ourselves. To uh, what's I have a saying, but I forgot it. Uh, you know better when you do better. That's the same. People who are uneducated, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes I like being ignorant to certain problems. I don't want to know about it. I want to live life and happiness. Me and my boyfriend doing good. We happy. Don't come telling me he cheating on me. I don't want to know. I want to be happy and peace. Let me get cheated on in peace. We out here traveling and stuff. Don't tell me he got a girlfriend on the side. Come ruining my party and stuff. Um, organizations need to listen to what youth need. It's kind of like Apple. Apple always giving you these updates that you're not asking for, like, and start taking stuff. They took the new charger away. Like, who asked for that? Like, who came up with that? That's not what the focus is. We want phones that don't mess up after two years of having them. Like, I hate when people think they know what's going on in youth's mind and what youth need. When you can just ask them, ask the people you're servicing, like your consumers are the key to your success. That makes the most sense. Um, it should be a balance of those with lived experience and those without. I don't like excluding people from the table just because they don't have lived experience. A lot of my friends have supported me through a lot of trauma, a lot of systems, a lot of things. I, I don't have any children, but I've helped friends who had children and were homeless. Like, just because I don't have the same experience doesn't mean I can't empathize and sympathize as well, and I don't understand it. Um... I have something else to say. I want youth at the table, but the whole table shouldn't just be youth. I tend to play devil's advocate. Um, and a lot of things that we've done with the YAB, and they're like, yeah, I want this program to buy me a car and to pay for my license. And I mean, I'm not going to lie, it was me. I still want somebody to buy me a car. I'm not paying for it. But in reality, how substantial and how long can that last? Like, where do those funds come from? What is like the background? I've had youth who lived in a program in a shelter, in a transitional program. And they were like, yeah, we have mold in our bathroom. And I'm like, okay, let me tell you something. How much of that mold 
comes from you not cleaning your bathroom. And then from there, I'm like, I'll talk to the program and be like, okay, they need life skills. They need to know how to maintain these things that we're giving them. You can't just give children, I'm not going to buy my son a dirt bike. And he hasn't taken care of his regular bike. You don't, you don't do, it doesn't work like that. Uh, guidance, educational pieces, you need help. Like, I, I, don't, I want people to stop pushing the narrative of go to school. A lot of our youth in our community are in school. There's a hidden number of youth in college, et cetera, et cetera, because they have nowhere else to go. And it was like, hey, I'm so, that was me. College really wasn't for me. I should have went to a trade school. It would have saved me $13,000, okay? Um, but my counselors were like, you're too smart. Like, you need to go to school. You need to figure out where to stay. Like, it's the answer. Um, investment in you. Um, find out what their skills are. Find out what they want to do outside of college. You can you can go to a trade school. You can have, you can be self-employed. You can do all these things. Um, I think that's it. I'm looking at my notes. I'm kind of cheating. Even though I hate using notes. And this is why. Oh, last thing. And then that's it. We can go to the next question, Desiree. Um, being trauma-informed, when you experience trauma, this is for everyone because it's not just you. This is human nature. When you experience trauma, you are mentally at that age that you experience that trauma at if you have not worked through that trauma and progressed past that trauma. So anger is a secondary emotion. You need to deal with the root causes. So if we're trauma informed, you have to be mindful that you in some way are stuck at that moment of trauma and things you may do may trigger trauma. You're stuck in you're stuck in a certain mindset, you're stuck. And it's not like you want to be stuck, but that's how our psych copes. It's a coping skill. That's just what we do. It's human, it's human nature. Yeah, so I just thinking about um, all the comments about, you know, in response to this question about what needs to change to shift more power to youth or to share power. Um, I agree that we, we all have the power to change that, right? And as a serve older ally, service provider and advocate, I have the responsibility to be really intentional and thoughtful about that. And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is how really just adultism and white supremacy culture get in the way of real collaboration and the cooperation you know, that you were talking about, Klaus, um, and how much that shows up in different ways. So, you know, white supremacy culture is really pervasive in a lot of, um, you know, the nonprofit sector, government agencies, a lot of organizations um, that are trying to work with and support youth. Um, so some of the concepts or all of the concepts that I'm thinking about right now are from Tema Okun's White Supremacy Culture. So I just wanna give credit to that resource, which just, um, popped into the chat, but things like perfectionism. Um, so being perfectionist and not putting time or energy into reflection and learning from mistakes. Um, this feeling that we can't be humble and say, we don't really know how to collaborate well with youth. We need to learn about this. It's okay. You know, if we don't have all the answers, we can be humble and come from a place of of wanting to learn. Um, a sense of urgency is another characteristic of white supremacy culture, which totally goes against taking the time to prioritize process and relationships, which in my experience, um, trying to learn about real authentic collaboration is like the key to everything, right? Slow down, um, listen, focus on relationships. Um, either or thinking, 
as another characteristic. So we either are going to make all the decisions or we're just going to give all the choices to youth without support. It's just real kind of um, black and white extreme thinking, um, defensiveness, so and power hoarding. Um, and so if you have, you know, people working in systems, service providers, older advocates um, who are used to having decision-making power, ways that we even unconsciously um, hoard that power and hold on to it um, and are sort of defensive when that's threatened. Um, and some of that, uh, you know, desire to hold on to power, I think, can come from another characteristic of white supremacy culture, which is feeling like, you know, I'm the only one. If something's going to get done right, I have to do it. And that also totally taps into adultism, um, you know, or this feeling that adults know better um, than younger people and that, you know, we have the right to make decisions because of that, because it's in the best interest of young people. Um, also acting like, you know, if we're the ones in power that we have a right to be comfortable, we have a right to physical and emotional comfort um, and not being willing to be uncomfortable, to be questioned by youth, um, to be told you're not doing what you should be doing, you're not doing what I need from you. Um, and to be able to hear that without scapegoating youth who cause discomfort, right? Or youth who speak up. Um, it's me, Ingrid. <laughs> I, be the, I be the sacrificial lamb. I be like, look, I don't, I told them today in the meeting, like, look, I'm here because I am who I am and y'all love what I do. So don't be mad that I'm being me with you. This is how I get, this is my method and this is how stuff gets done. So I'm not taking no for an answer I'm not taking yeah I hear that this isn't right and I hear that this is wrong but there's nothing we can do about it. who do I need to speak to your boss's boss I'll wait here all day definitely so how do how do we think about how we can receive that feedback and welcome that feedback and hold space for that feedback and do better and it's okay you know, it's not going to be perfect. Um, so, yeah, I think even just going to that resource about white supremacy culture and just really thinking about those things and in the context of youth collaboration, to me, um, has been super helpful. And I don't know. If I think everyone just wants the credit. Everybody want to put their name on everything. Everybody wants to be the genius. But coming from a true genius, I don't care about the genius to see unless money is involved. Like if I'm a genius that came up with the idea, give me the credit. <laughs> if I'm getting paid, don't take my credit. But as long as the work gets done, I don't care. Like everybody wants to be a leader. It's, it's too many chiefs in my it's not enough people that follow. And I don't even know if that's offensive. If that's offensive, I apologize. Someone educate me. But Everybody want to lead. And some people don't know how to be leaders of packs. Some people, like myself, are natural board leaders. But even as a leader, you have to learn how to follow. You have to learn. And like me, I don't always have all the answers. People are like, so what should we do? And I be like, I just know this is an issue. Like this specific, it's sometimes I don't know. Sometimes we don't know. Uh, my, one of my college professor, professors, my, um, Ingrid, what's it called when um, they like who you sign up and do your classes with? They're not your mentor. Your advisor? Your advisor. Thank you. So my advisor, she told me, if you ever want to solve a problem with my mass communications major, uh, my mass communication professor, she told me, if you ever want to start a problem, you start at the problem and work your way back. If you ever want to achieve a goal, you start at the goal and work your way back. It's easier to say, hey, I want to do this. Okay, how do I get to that? From that step, how do I come back? And you trace the steps back to yourself. As well as she told me, be a rhino. And that's what I'm doing, okay? Rhinos, you think, they're kind of like elephants. You think, no, not elephants. They're like lazy. 
You think they're really lazy sometimes. No, when you think about a rhino, they just be laying there for a long time sometimes. But when they get moving, they are unstoppable. And they're so, like, their skin is so thick and indestructible almost. Like, you got to plummet through stuff. So, like, I think I'm living up to that. That one year of college taught me a lot, y'all. I was depressed and not going to class. But the things I did learn, I retained. Um, I work with kids, like I said, and they're small adults, really. If we stop trying to baby people or limit what people can do, you will see that um, they're really smart. Angry can attest. I have two-year-olds talking about collaborating. Like, what? How do you know that? Two-year-olds, they astonish me every day. When you give people and you explain and you comprehend, you let them be able to comprehend, they will surprise you. Uh, let me see. I'm looking at my notes again. Oh, yeah. When you see a child as an adult capable and making full decisions for themselves, you treat them differently. Are you, when you break it down, like I said, and say, here's this, here's this, here's your options with this, Here's your options with this. That's my biggest thing. I love being told my options and my pros and cons. Um, I do this in meetings. I'm like, okay, yeah, this needs to get done. But if I halt this whole process, y'all, what's the repercussions? What does it look like? Is that something I'm going to be able to sleep with that night, knowing that we have to scrap this and it may take another year? And sometimes I may be willing to eat that. Because if it's, it hasn't been functioning this long, uh, another year of it not, it's not going to function properly anyway if we don't fix it. So I'll take another year in order for us to start over and improve and may, not maybe, because it should always be a living organism. Youth um, services should always be a living, thriving organism that progresses. It gets better. It gets better. It gets better. Like, that's how we self-improve. You always should be like, you should always find something wrong to make something work smoothly. I think that's the issue. We don't always take time to update the system. We just know it's wrong. And it's like, what do we do? Some people like being stagnant. I don't like that. If it don't work, scrap it. Start all the way over. That's how I clean. That's everything. Everything got to come out and go on the floor and start from a clean slate. And I don't care how long it takes me. I have to fold everything, put it back, and then it, it's perfect. You start trying to bandage stuff up. It just don't work. So before we start with the Q&A, I did want to add and highlight something that you said, Lola. Um, working on life skills is something that is very important. You can't just give a youth a house. You can't just give them a job and, and not teach them how to navigate once they have those things and you leave their presence. Here at His Hope Ministries, that's what we do. We work on their barriers first, like things like birth certificates, IDs, stuff like that, that they really need in order to get housing. And then we work on life skills so that when they get a job, when they get a house, they have budget budgets. They know how to budget right. They know how to cook and clean. You know, when they're in the house, they know how to wash their clothes properly. They know how to, I don't know, like interview. They know they have a resume already made. They have all these things that sets them up for life so that they don't, you know, go back into that same situation that they were in before. So that's very important to work on that. And we have a lot of success stories from that process so that's a really good process now before oh, we do any oh, more oh, oh. <laughs> go angry and then i'll go and then we can ask questions i was just gonna say desiree piggybacking on the life skills piece just made me think about you know what everyone was talking about earlier about the emotional side of that so it's the skills but also recognizing like you know one of my main goals um, in legal services is helping youth get housing, youth and young adults get housing. But I've learned, you know, just getting your own apartment, even though that's like the goal, 
can be so scary when you've never had your name on a lease before. It's all this responsibility and really isolating because a lot of housing programs have rules where you can't have anyone live with you. You can't have anyone stay for more than 14 days. And so that whole like peer network and the mutual aid kind of connections that you've built in order to survive, all of a sudden there's this expectation that that's going to be cut off. You know, you might be one of the only people, you know, if you know other youth who are experiencing homelessness who got housing, and then you're supposed to sort of leave everyone behind, um, which can bring up feelings like Chris was talking about before of like leaving siblings behind, like just, there's just so much trauma and so much emotion that's wrapped up in all of those experiences. And so like law and policy just doesn't recognize that a lot of the time services don't recognize that a lot of the time it's, it's treated as like, Oh, this is just a really concrete life skill. Um, and doesn't really, um, recognize how loaded those things are. Um, and, you know, I think everyone mentioned, including myself, this kind of like self judgment, um, and like self-destructive or self-sabotaging behaviors, even when you're starting to get the things that you want and you need. And so, yeah, like just being flexible and recognizing that if someone's having a hard time and they are, it it does seem like there's some like self-sabotaging stuff going on just to like give a lot of time, a lot of space, a lot of support. Things aren't always linear. Um, We're scared of growth and adults do it. People who haven't experienced homelessness do it. Like it's the unknown. It's freaking scary. Moving to Baltimore from Georgia, it was scary. I was terrified. I was crying. And literally my counselor was like, why are you scared of change? Like change can be good. But who wants to hear that? I'm like, y'all, I'm scared. And you telling me change can be good. Like what the heck? And, you know, having, getting my own apartment and experiencing that, like, my friends, don't tell nobody. I hope ain't nobody on here from housing, but I've let people stay with me. Like, how dare I, after I've gotten a place, say, no, you can't crash on my, my couch. Like, what I do, though, is say, okay, we need to get you down social services. We need to get you get some food stamps. From there, you can list as homeless. Who knew you had to be registered as homeless? How am I going to tell? I'm homeless. What you want me to say? Like, but that's the way you go down social services and you get registered as homeless. I put people on to how to navigate these systems. Um, I had someone else up. I forgot. Chris. Chris is back. Chris, do you have anything to comment? Comment, like, subscribe, click the bell in the corner. This is on YouTube, right? Um, what what was the question again? I don't think my thing was working whenever it was asked. Really, we were like into three, number three and four, all in one. What we really, really were based, uh, we were talking about based on your youth leadership experience, what are some specific ways that systems and service providers can engage in authentic collaboration with you? I don't know. Um, I guess think of it as like, put yourself in that youth's shoes. Imagine what they're going through. Try to look at it from their perspective, how they may feel. And like, um, I guess you could, you could tell like that's probably not something cool that someone wants to deal with. No one should ever have to, but it but it's a reality, and you just need to know when to like approach that situation and how to do it. And um, I feel as if that that could definitely like help things a lot better, move things along smoother through the system. Um, it would be easier for both sides as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got on this situation. I think we should find the cheat codes. Like I found the cheat codes. Klaus has found the cheat codes. 
Um, I know when to go to social services. I know what time. I know what to bring. I know I'm going to be there all day. I know what I can't bring in because they check you out the door to a freaking, um, what's a metal detector? You got to open out your purse and all that stuff. So I've thrown away perfume, food, but like it's stuff. So I think we need to figure out what the cheat codes are and figure out how to make them not have to be cheat codes. Like that, that works. DSS and any other service that has to aid youth should have a designated area. Like it should be there someone to help them. Like just like you provide services to people with disabilities, you need to provide services for people who don't understand and comprehend how to navigate. It's the same thing. Same thing, but different. And also maybe even have at least one youth leader that is collaborating with these youth. I know like with Youth Reach, they get youth ambassadors that have lived experience to hand out those, those um, surveys so that youth aren't intimidated by service providers with suits and, and fancy clothes and flashy cars. And here they are with a bag on their, you know, on their shoulder. So that definitely helps. But because of time, <laughs> we are gonna switch to the Q&A. So I am going to let Isabel go ahead and moderate that. Hey everybody. Oh good, I was a small video and now I'm big. Um, thanks so much uh, for sharing everything that you've shared so far. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you all so much. Um, so we do have quite a few questions from the Q&A um, chat box. Thank you all. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you all um, was to get into a little bit more specifics than what you all have been um, sharing. Um, if you all had any specific suggestions for how folks listening today can begin to engage with youth or initiate relationships with youth that have lived experience, um, especially those who uh, may be couch surfing um, or experiencing other forms of housing instability. I say get youth leaders, like I was saying just a minute ago, definitely have youth that have that experience that are maybe even still going through it. Somebody that is powerful enough to voice what they're going through and connect with that youth and go to the community them, themselves. I know with Youth Reach, we would go to the housing authorities. We would go to the places where youth, homeless youth would, you know, gather around and we would talk to them, not like, we would talk to them like we were normal people, you know, not, not anything different. We're not different from you. We're not saying, oh, you look homeless. We just like, hey, how are you doing today? You know, like, where are you from? You know, you live here, like, like friends and definitely just make them feel welcome. Don't make them feel like you're digging into their business, like Lola said. <laughs> Desiree, you in my business? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um. One, just like anything, like you want to get next. This is a bad analogy, but y'all know I'm the parable of analogies. So I got all the parables. You want to get next to Tiger? Do you have the training to get next to Tiger? Not that youth are Tigers. So I said it was bad. But are you informed? Are you um, considerate? Are you kind? Are you a people person? My camera went out because my phone died, but I got enough. Are you a people person? Are you relatable? Can you get down on their level? Like, these are things you have to learn. I had to learn it in childcare. You have to learn it in any field you go into. If you want to help you start there, educate yourself. And then you won't be so ignorant and you won't offend and you won't be messing up. And there's a lot of research. It's a lot of stuff you can do. Systematic things, things about people's neighborhoods and areas, cultural things, cultural awareness. That's really big. Okay. 
me, I'm a city girl. I'm from New York City, but I lived in the South. So I'm multifaceted. I like country living, but I like trains and traffic and big crowds. But my anxiety, my asthma. Anybody else got a response? I think a big portion of a uh of of necessarily collaboration cooperation just working together in general is understanding um i've said this many a times and i will continue to say it this will be the hill that i die on i'm pretty sure but you have to be able to like chris said you have to be able to look at yourself well you have to be able to look at the situation or the or the whatever may have you the situation the discussion whatever from the other party's perspective um, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken in therapy, I was taught that's called cog uh, cognitive realignment. One thing that you have to be able to do is to be able to understand how another person's feeling and why their situation is the way it is. Um, you don't have to go into the deeper, like, you know, the, the deeper details of trauma and things of that nature. But what you, what you should do is understand why that person is in front of you understand why that person is coming to you, understand why an individual is is asking or requesting whatever they are from you for whatever reason may have you. Um, in my personal experience, I have been turned away from many a jobs where I work, where I actually needed financial stability. I was in desperate need for it, and yet I was turned away from jobs left and right. One, because you know, I was, as a homeless youth, I did not have the proper attire. I was not, I did not have access to that. So therefore, I mean, I did. I, I walked in with some cargo shorts and a t-shirt, a graphic tee, and a and a, and a beanie on. You know what I mean? Like that's all I had. That's all. That's all I had on my back. That's all I was traveling for that day. So I mean, like the only thing you can do is accept me as I come. And then, you know, as I walk into the waiting room for the interview, and then I look around and I see a whole bunch of other brothers in there. They all got three piece suits, got gold watches, gold bracelets, watches on. They rolled up in BMWs and things like that. And I just look around. And I was like, <laughs> this ain't for me. I, I'm not I'm obviously not getting anywhere here. And and in fact, I did not get anywhere. I actually walked up to the uh, to the front desk to, to check in for my interview. And the woman looked at me and she was like, yeah, I think we're all booked for the interviews today. I was like, oh, okay. I can clearly look right behind me and see like eight people waiting for their interview, but okay. Right, you're booked. So like they're, they're like from my situation that I'm, I'm more than positive that I would have been given, given at least the opportunity of an interview if there was a sense of understanding of what position I was in and why I was there in the first place. Ideally, none of us would be working, none of us would have jobs, because ideally in a world that, you know, in, in an ideal world, we don't require that. We don't require, you know, like, you know, labor, we don't require finances to pay for things, everything's just given, you know, in an ideal world, but unfortunately, we don't live in that. So with that being said, all the things that I endure have to ha have come from something. And in order for me to rectify those situations, I'm here for a reason. And a lot of individuals that are in that place of power, they don't have that understanding of this person is here in front of me for a reason. They're just concerned with filling a position for a job or, 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 you know, or, you know, whatever may have you as far as their business and things like that. They're not mostly concerned with the situation that the individual in front of them is going through. Because even though I looked bummy in front of that, you know, in front of the, in front of the, the, the front desk attendant, I could have been one of the best workers that they could have asked for, but I would have never been given that, I, I wasn't given that opportunity to be based on my appearance. So there has to have that, uh, that level of understanding, that, uh, that, that, that level of uh, cognitive realignment. We've got to understand where, yeah, where everybody is and we got to meet each other halfway. That's the only way we're going to, we're we'll be able to, able to, we'll be able to get each other from point A to point B and then so on and so forth all the way to Z. Otherwise, we're always going to be stuck at A, B, and C because we can't understand why D, E, and F is the way they are. I had to think again. I was like, did I say that right? Did I say the alphabet right? I had to think about that. But yeah, I did. I got that right. <laughs> um, does anyone else have an answer to that question? Ingrid, I saw I'll, you come up. I'll be really quick because I, I don't want to take a lot of the time. I just I totally echo like being non-judgmental and also just like get curious about people, get curious about learning what makes people tick as an individual. Um, don't think that you already know 
what someone's perspective is on something or their ideas on because you know one little tiny thing about their experience. Um, and then in a real concrete way, for, for all of us who are trying to learn from youth, compensate them for teaching you. And that should be a given at this point. I think it should go without saying, but like pay them well for their expertise and their time. And the pay gift. me, feed yeah, me, make you. sure I have transportation. <laughs> I be telling people, it, if Beyonce was coming, would you not have something laid out for her to snack on or something? Don't get me what I had this experience, y'all. I'm not lying. I said, okay, I'm going to be here for three to four hours. Y'all paying me? Like, okay, here's what you're going to pay me. At least a minimum of $100. And what's for lunch? Like, and then lunch was the afterthought. Like, the person got what they wanted. No, 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 no. Ask me. You don't know if I have an allergy. You don't know be mindful. I need to be on your forefront. Like, but anyways, next question, please. As well. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to let y'all know that a lot of people in the chat have been, um, sharing their appreciation to you all. Um, and especially for sharing your personal stories. So I just wanted to shout that out. Um, we are getting close to the end, so uh, we've got about five more minutes, just a heads up. Um, but the last question, um, if you could give one piece of advice to a youth or young adult that is currently experiencing housing instability or homelessness, what would you say? I would definitely say that just know you're not alone. A lot of people, like I said, you, homelessness does not have a face. A lot of people are going through it. Maybe even some of your peers that you don't even realize. I know I was in high school, my senior year, I was homeless, I was pregnant. I was sleeping in my car, going to a friend's house to shower in the morning, then going to class every day, like nothing ever happened. And I got through it. Get the help that you need. Don't ever be scared of what somebody's going to say, because those people mean nothing. They really don't. Their words mean nothing. It's your future. It's where you're going to sleep at night. It's what you're going to eat the next day. Don't worry about what other people think, because I did all that. And I'm here now because I chose to speak up about my homelessness. And now I'm helping other youth in that same position. I'd say, don't wait. Don't make the same mistake I did, where I've waited four years to actually try to go out there and try to achieve your goals. Because within those four years, I probably would already be living on my own with a car and a job. But I'm stuck in the situation because I took too long to reach out. I wasn't crying out for help loud enough. You need to get out there. Um, yeah yes that was my same exact statement chris it was like sometimes <laughs> it doesn't get better until you make it better like things don't just change overnight and everybody's path is different i've had to inform my friends and you can be the person that informs others like my friends thought i just was like oh you're just unemployed you don't want to work i don't want to work for anyone i like working for myself I like being an independent contractor. I like filling out 1099. I like doing it. I'm not going on no interview, begging nobody for no job. Like, don't ask me why I want to work here. You need somebody to fill a position. You need me. What do you mean? So, like, yeah, like, you have to make it better. You have to make the conscious decision to be better. And surround yourself with like-minded people. You're never alone. It's a word called sonder. It means we are all humans having the same experiences and living. So your life is just as multifaceted and complex as mine. Like we're all dealing with our own inner turmoil and our own issues at the same time. Doesn't matter who you are. It's life. And it sucks. <laughs> But you make it better. You find your happiness. You find your peace. I was given a piece of really good advice two years ago. And I want to say two and a half, maybe three. And that piece of advice is something that I repeat to myself practically daily, I want to say. 
um, from Youth Empowered Society, uh, one of the uh, one of the mentors there, his name is Nick Brooks. He uh, he one day he said to me while we were in self, he said, "All change must be intentional." And from then on, those were the words that rang through my head whenever I needed to make a decision or I felt as if something needed to change in my personal life that I needed to make something happen. That power that you have over your life, like Lola, like Lola said, this is your life. This is every choice that you make is every choice that you make for yourself. That is extremely important. Um, and my, through my experience, I've always been extremely uh, motivated and know and, and achieving what is more than what I was going through. I know I mentioned this before. Um, I always knew that there was better for me, that this would not last forever. And I was determined to see the end of my suffering, to see the end of the hardship that I was going through. I was I would no I was no less short of of motivated just to see the end of the problems that I was going through, and of course my problems aren't over. Nobody's problems are ever over, but the problem but but the thing is is that the thing that I wanted to be changed, the thing that I wanted to change has been changed. The thing that I was going through that I wanted to no longer experience that has changed. All the change that I wanted to make was intentional. I made the effort and I did it. So therefore, that, that is the biggest piece of advice that I can give anybody. If you want things to change, make it happen because nobody's gonna make it happen but you, for you. I know we're like really close, but I just wanna add to what Klaus said. Really, it's all about your mindset through it. Life is full of ups and downs. It always will be, not just for us as homeless youth, but for everybody, people that are doing amazing in life. Everybody has downfalls. It's about your mindset through it. You have to manifest positivity at all times. Always know that when you fall, that just means that you have the chance to rise back up. It's a chance to do better. It's, it's a learning experience. Just take it. Thank you all so much. Unfortunately, I know we had quite a few more questions in the chat, but we are at the end. Uh, so I just want to give everyone the chance to say some quick closing remarks um, since we're about out of time. Um, Desiree, I'll hand it to you first. I just wanted to say if there's any youth that you know of on the Midshore region, um, definitely give me a call, an email. I have my email in the chat, I believe. Um, let us know, we can help. And we have advocacy um, groups and stuff where they could do the exact same thing that we're doing here today. They wanna be a part. I wanna say, I, I thank you all for being, for allowing us to be in this space to have this conversation. These, these conversations aren't had so, so casually. They have to be organized. They have to be forced. They have to be invited into these sorts of spaces to have these kind of talks. Um, so by all means, thank you for allowing us to have this conversation. And we just hope that, well, I personally just hope, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I'm pretty confident when I say that I, that we're all, that we all want this conversation to continue. We want this conversation to be had in all spaces, casually and seriously, because the more people that talk, the more information that gets shared and the more information that gets shared, the more problems get solved. Not maybe, not maybe not for us, but for a youth out there that's experiencing some hardship that can easily be solved with some help. So by all means, with this little bit of support, all of our support goes out a long way. So thank you. Um, I'd like to say it's been a pleasure working alongside all these great people. I've enjoyed it very much. And um, for any youth that end up seeing this video, if you got problems in your life, barriers are meant to be broken. Um, if you want to do something, go out there and do it. If you can dream it, you can do it. I'm getting a little emotional right at the end. I just want to, um, I don't know, it like got me choked up when you said that, Chris. Um, I just want to quickly express so much gratitude and respect and, and love for this group. And thank you for everything that you shared tonight. I'm going to keep thinking about it. And I hope that everyone 
um, watching who is in this work will think of some concrete steps that you can put into practice and really take action based on um, what's been shared this evening. I'm muted. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Thank you, Ingrid. You know you're my favorite lawyer. You're my only lawyer. Um, the title of this was Misfit Links to Deeper Change. And I'm going off script, y'all. The missing link is you. You're the missing link. Find something you're passionate about within this topic. Advocate for it. Make the difference. I don't care who tells you no. Don't take that for an answer. Be kind to people. Um, be compassionate. Um, it doesn't matter. Like, really, at the end of the day, we are all human beings. It doesn't matter. Like, just be considerate. Um, I'm Lola J. Anyone, my email has been dropped if you want to reach out. Last thing, use whatever your superpower is. Mine is being hard-headed and talking a lot. And I'm using it for good. You see how I flip that? I'm using it for good. So find your super, find your superpower and use it for good. Oh, that's my dog. Thank you to our incredible panelists. Um, we appreciate your willingness to share with us and to teach us tonight and for all of the planning meetings and effort that you have put into this event over the past few months and for the work that you do on the regular. Um, today's panel gives us a small window on the excellent leadership among our youth to whom we should be turning for meaningful and equitable responses and the need for transparency, collaboration, openness, flexibility, respect, and care. I also want to name and thank everyone who has worked for months on this event to bring this event to you. It was truly a joy to share in this endeavor with a talented and caring group of people. Isabel Garcia from the School of Social Work Development Office, Anita Bryant from the School of Social Work Communication and the Institute, um, other folks from the Institute, Gary Wonitzik, Carrie Gould-Gobbler, Michelle Boardman, Meredith Gunn, Mushka and Juliana have been providing us with ASL interpretation. And finally, the incomparable Zalika Woods who steered us throughout. Please be on the lookout for information about our fall 2021 Thurs event, which will focus on environmental justice. I also wanna remind you to join the Institute for the Virtual 2021 Sparking Positive Change Symposium to End Youth Homelessness that will be held May 26th through 27th, 2021. The symposium will provide an opportunity to learn and share best practices and effective strategies to prevent and ultimately end youth homelessness across Maryland. This symposium also offers a unique opportunity to network and collaborate with organizations and jurisdictions about challenges specific to youth housing instability and homelessness. Registration will open soon and please save the date. Thank you to everyone who shared questions, comments, and kudos in the chat and to everyone who joined us. Wishing you all a good evening. <laughs>